Uh, hello, everyone. Um, today, I would like to read chapter two of my book, um, The Diaries and Letters of Sir Ernest Mason Sato, 1843 to 1929, a scholar diplomat in East Asia, um, which is about his early years in Japan, 1862 to 1869. Uh, in many ways, it's the most uh, difficult chapter that I had to write of the seven chapters because um, he'd already uh, published, in 1921, he published uh, A Diplomat in Japan, which was about those years. So it was a matter of finding or attempting to find things which were not covered in, in that book, and not, not simply uh, repeating old uh, information, as it were. So that was quite a challenge. Um, but before I do that, I think I'd just like to share the screen, um, which I'm doing now, there we are. Um, this is uh, the book available or not available on amazon.com. Uh, it's listed as a paperback, which is incorrect. Um, and then, it, well, it says paperback up here, and then it says hardcover here from $278, which is rather more than when it was first published in 1998, but I suppose these things do go up in price. Um, but I thought I'd take a look at the um, publisher's website and I found it there. Uh, so there we are, it, it's right there. And it's $299.95, so let's call that 300, shall we? Uh, <laughs> $300, which seems an awful lot, but there we are um and apparently it's still for sale um and there's the publishers well there's the blurb uh um uh yes nigel braley who is is now the late nigel braley uh was very nice about it um and just to give you it shows you the outline there or the table of contents the forward and preface by Preface by William Core, which I read in the previous video. And I also read chapter one, which was early life and upbringing, early life in London, promising scholar, University College London and China. And today I'm proposing to read number two, chapter two, early years in Japan from Shogunate to Meiji, first home leave Sidmouth, leave Sidmouth and Germany. Uh, and if there seems to be enough interest, which I suppose is governed by the number of um, views that I see uh, the video attracting. Uh, I can always continue with the rest of it. Um, Japan, 1870 to 83, the so-called wilderness years, that, that was my misnomer or noma, <laughs> what I called them, 1884 to 94, uh, Siam, and uh, Uruguay and Morocco are in there. Back to Japan in chapter five, 1895 to 1900. China, 1900 to 1906, and then retirement, and then the appendices and so on. So um, really that's it, uh, that is the book. Um, but I'm now going to go back to, uh, I'll stop sharing the screen and I will make a start on reading uh, chapter two. Early years in Japan, 1862 to 69, a diplomat in Japan. Sato relates the story of his early years in Japan in his memoirs entitled A Diplomat in Japan, hereafter referred to as Diplomat, first published in 1921. Although there were editions in 1968, Oxford, that's Oxford University Press, and 1983, Tuttle. In recent years, it has been out of print, which is regrettable as it provides a fascinating insight into the critical years 1862 to 69. Well, since 2000, there have certainly been quite a few, like I wouldn't like to know to, to say how many, but it's, it's no longer out of print, I think it's fair to say. Um, essentially, an elaboration on Sato's diary it tends to suggest that he was more important than he in fact was, although he was indeed near the center of events and knew or met all of the key figures, both foreign and Japanese, 
in pre-restoration Bakumatsu, Japan. Also the title uh, chosen by the publisher, not Sato, is misleading in the sense that Sato did not become a fully fledged diplomat until he became minister in Siam. Before that, he was a member of the consular service. Okay, so it's a, the distinction between consular and diplomatic service, um, which uh, obtained for well, well into, well into the 20th century. And uh, so he wasn't actually a, a diplomat in Japan. He was a, a consular official in Japan, I suppose, but it doesn't sound as good. So. Um, anyway, a Japanese translation of the whole text by Sakata Seiichi, first published in 1960, is currently available in a cheap paperback edition from Iwanami Bunko. So that's a small uh, paperback editions that we find in Japan. However, the book was banned from general circulation in Japan from 1924 until the end of World War II. And it was only available in a much abridged translation to Japanese researchers from 1938 as Ishin Nihon Gaiko Hiroku, Secret Memoirs, Memories, sorry, of the Meiji Restoration. Sakata suggests that the government wanted the Japanese people to, to view the restoration as a great and glorious event and that Sato's memoirs were too near the bone for comfort. The subtitle of the book explains its content more fully. It is the inner history of the critical years in the evolution of Japan when the ports were opened and the monarchy restored, recorded by a diplomatist who took an active part in the events of the time with an account of his personal experiences during that period. It was written in two stages. The first portion was written between 1885 and 1887, while Sato was Her Majesty's Minister in Bangkok. The second part was completed during Sato's retirement between September 1919 and January 1921 at the urging of younger relations. It is mainly a transcript of Sato's journals, a diary, supplemented by his papers in the Foreign Office's confidential print, more properly known as confidential correspondence and papers, uh, his letters to Sir Harry Parks and to his mother. The 36 chapters begin with Sato's appointment as a student interpreter at Edo. After introducing Yokohama society and giving a brief history of political conditions in Japan, Sato recounts various major events, including Richardson's murder, the Nam Namamugi incident, the bombardments of Kagoshima and Shimonoseki, ratification of the treaties by the Mikado emperor, various travels in the Japanese hinterland, the, business, the Bizen affair, the Kobe incident, the Sakai incident in which French sailors were murdered and so on. The final chapter describes Sato's last days in Tokyo and his departure for home in 1869. And I'm actually, uh, I've been reading uh, A Diplomat in Japan on my channel as well. So if you prefer just to hear that, yeah, you can switch to that uh, within my channel on YouTube. In, uh, so continue now. Diplomat is, of course, not the only source available to historians interested in Sato. The, the original diaries sometimes give further and more private details, and there is a vast reservoir of primary sources in Japanese archives still to be tapped or translated. At the same time, it should be remembered that throughout this period, Sato was still a very young man of low rank in the legation with a vital mission to learn the language above all. Japanese studies. Sato devotes half of the fifth chapter of Diplomat to describing his Japanese studies. He had left London without any of the very few books that had been published on the language. He was fortunate, therefore, to be introduced in Kanagawa to two Americans, Dr. James C. Hebern, that's H-E-P-B-U-R-N, and the Reverend Dr. Samuel R. Brown, on 9th of September, the day after his arrival in Yokohama. Hebern, the first missionary physician in Japan, was in the process of editing his Japanese to English dictionary. The first work of its kind, it was published in 1867 as Wa e Gorin Shusei. He was also responsible for the system of romanization which bears his name and is still widely used. Brown, another missionary, was just then printing his colloquial Japanese and generously allowed Sato to have the first few sheets as they came over from the printing office in Shanghai. 
Sato struggled at first with no teacher and living at a hotel could not find a quiet place to study. He was kept awake by raucous noise from the bowling alley and nightly quarrels. Not only that, Colonel Neal, that's N-E-A-L-E, -E, chargé d'affaires while Alcock was on leave, ordered Sato and his colleague, Russell B. Robertson, to attend every day at the office, we did not call it the chancery then, to ask if our services were required and what work we had consisted chiefly of copying dispatches and interminable accounts. That's quoting from a diplomat in Japan. Towards the end of October, after Sato protested that the clerical work was interfering with his studies, he and Robertson were allowed mornings free for study until one o'clock. Also, they persuaded the Colonel to consent to them getting two lessons a week from the Reverend Brown and to allow them to engage a native teacher, teacher in inverted commas, at the public expense. They hired one more at their own expense, though Robertson returned home early in 1863 after the legation in Edo was subject to subjected to an arson attack by Choshu extremists, leaving Sato to pay for the private lessons in full. So Robertson and Sato had come over from Shanghai, but uh, by this time Robertson had decided to go home. The Reverend Brown's lessons were the most useful ones. Brown heard Sato read sentences from his book and explained the grammar. Takaoka Kaname, a doctor from Wakayama, gave lessons in the epistolary, that's letter writing style. He used to write a short letter in the running hand and after copying it out in square character, explained its meaning. Then Sato translated the letter into English and put it away for a few days. Meanwhile, he would read both the copies of the original. Later, he took out his translation and tried to put it back into Japanese from memory. This was a laborious process but Sato managed to learn many of the standard phrases used in letters and gained a basic competence in reading. Sato learned a tradesman's writing style from an old man afflicted with a watery eye. That's an in inverted commas, that phrase. <laughs> can, you, can you imagine? Afflicted with a watery eye. The difficulties of le learning while enduring the constant drip from the diseased orbit, again, diseased orbit is in inverted commas, which fell now on the copybook, now on the paper I was writing on, as he leant over to correct a bad stroke, now on the table, must have been considerable. To make matters worse, this style was not appropriate for Sato's status. Several years later, he learned a more beautiful version of the same Onye Ryu style, but it was not until after the revolution of 1868 that he learned the picturesque Karayo Chinese style from Takasai Tanzan, described by Sato as one of the half dozen best teachers in Tokyo. He claims modestly that he never came to have good handwriting or to compose error-free Japanese, yet there is evidence of greatly improved handwriting. Also, Sato points out that most of his work for seven or eight years was the translation of official documents, which was not calculated to ensure correctness. This part is in inverted commas, not calculated to ensure correctness, as the translator's attention is more bent on giving a faithful rendering of the original than on writing good Japanese. Oh, so this was from English to Japanese then, yes. In June, 1863, a note came from one of the Shogun's ministers, the exact wording of which was important. 10 months after his arrival in Japan, this was Sato's first real chance to test his ability in translating from a text written in the epistolary style. Although no one could say if his version was better than the ones produced by the Japanese secretary Richard Usden from the Dutch or Alexander von Siebold from the Japanese with the aid of his teacher, at last Sato, Sato's study was paying dividends. For the first time, his name was mentioned and his translation was included in the diplomatic correspondence. Within a short time, he was in a position to displace the middlemen the relatively overpaid interpreters of the Dutch language through whom all correspondence with the Japanese government had been carried on until that time. Alexander von Siebold was the 16-year-old son of the noted pioneer Japanologist Philip Franz von Siebold, 1796 to 1866, who had been in Japan from 1823 until his expulsion in 1829 and had returned in 1859. 
Alexander had been born in Germany and had been taken on by Alcock, Sir Rutherford Alcock, as a supernumerary interpret interpreter because of his ability to converse in the language, which he had acquired through living in the country with his father since the age of 13. Sato soon surpassed him in his ability to decipher documents. Uh, next is the Richardson affair or Namamugi incident. Yeah. In the Richardson affair, also known as the Namamugi incident, that's the modern, uh, uh, the way it's known in modern uh, books. A British merchant from Shanghai, Mr. Charles Richardson was killed by retainers of the daimyo of Satsuma on the Tokaido highway at the village of Namamugi near the foreign settlement in Yokohama. This watershed incident which was to demonstrate graphically the weakness of the shogunate happened on the 14th of September, 1862, just six days after Sato's arrival in Japan. The precise details of the affair are difficult to pin down as there are various versions. It seems likely that Richardson had refused to dismount from his horse and had advanced as far as the daimyo's palanquin, so incurring the wrath of the feudal lord accustomed to dogeza, Protest, uh, prostration so that the head touches the ground from low ranking Japanese as he passed. So uh, it, it was probably a failure to dismount, although uh, I think that's not absolutely certain. Uh, at any rate, there, were, there was some problem uh, with failure to show respect. Um, and also I have, uh, there is a, a version of the, of what happened uploaded to my YouTube channel um, uh, from a documentary drama done in 1992 by Antelope Films, uh, the BBC and Asahi Television. So um, anyway, let's continue. Uh, Sato relates the incident as follows. The rest, this is in quotation marks. On the 14th of September, a most barbarous murder was committed on a Shanghai merchant named Richardson. He, in, a co in company with a Mrs. Borrowdale of Hong Kong and Woodthorpe C. Clark and William Marshall, both of Yokohama, were riding along the high road between Kanagawa and Kawasaki when they met with a train of daimyo's retainers who bid them stand aside. They passed on at the edge of the road until they came in sight of a palanquin occupied by Shimazu Saburo father of the Prince of Satsuma. They were now ordered to go back and as they were wheeling their horses in obedience, were suddenly set upon by several armed men belonging to the train who hacked at them with their sharp edged heavy swords. Richardson fell from his horse in a dying state and the two other men were so severely wounded that they called out to the lady, ride on, we can do nothing for you. She got safely back to Yokohama and gave the alarm. Everybody in the settlement who possessed a pony and a revolver at once armed himself and galloped off towards the scene of the slaughter. Sato is in no doubt that the four foreigners were in the right. He cl his claim that they were turning their horses obediently is disputed by some Japanese authorities who suggest that the foreigners did not understand or pretended not to understand that they were being told to go back. <clears throat> Sato uh, continues to relate the subsequent reaction of the foreign community, and in particular, the heroic actions of his friend Willis. He was one of the first on the scene, riding for a mile past the Satsuma Daimyo's procession along the high road through Kanagawa. Joined by three or four more Englishmen, he reached Namamugi where Richardson's corpse was lying under the shade of a tree by the roadside. His throat had been cut and his body was covered with sword cuts. Yes, in the uh, antelope uh, version, um, he, they do dismount, which is interesting. Uh, I don't know why they, Sato seems fairly clear that they didn't. Um, and that perhaps that was the problem. Anyway, Richardson's lacerated body was removed from the scene immediately and taken to the American consulate in Kanagawa. Pan paranoia and panic were rife in the settlement of Yokohama. It was the first time a foreign merchant had been attacked. Again, in quotation marks, this had a most powerful effect on the minds of Europeans who came to look on every two-sworded man as a probable assassin. And if they met one in the street, thanked God as soon as they had passed him 
and find themselves in safety. Revenge clouded the minds of many foreigners. The temptation to strike back immediately and teach the impudent Japanese a lesson was strong, but it was the most foolish of options as it would no doubt have led to all out war. Again, a long quotation from a diplomat in Japan here. It was known that Shimazu Saburo was to lie that night at Hodogaya, a post town scarcely two miles from Yokohama. To surround and seize him with the united forces of all the foreign vessels in port would, in their opinion, have been both easy and justifiable, and viewed by the light of our later knowledge, not only of Japanese politics, but also of Japanese ideas with regard to the right of taking redress, they were not far wrong. In the absence of any organized police or military force able to keep order among the turbulent two-sworded class, it cannot be doubted that this course would have been adopted by any Japanese clan against whom such an offense had been committed. And the foreign nationalities in Japan were in the same position as a native clan. They were subject to the authorities of their own country who had jurisdiction over them both in criminal and civil matters and were responsible for keeping them within the bounds of the law and for their protection against attack." End of quotation. The British consul called a meeting at which a motion to request the foreign naval authorities to land 1,000 men to arrest the daimyo and his retainers was discussed and rejected. A deputation then went to Colonel Neal, but they failed to sway him. Uh, again, quotation marks here. The idea had got abroad amongst the foreign community that Colonel Neal could not be trusted to take the energetic measures which they considered necessary under the circumstances. In fact, they found fault with him for preserving the cool bearing which might be expected from a man who had seen actual service in the field and which especially became a man in his responsible situation. And they thought that pressure could be put upon him uh, through his colleagues and the general opinion of the other foreign representatives. But in this expectation, they were disappointed. At the meeting, Colonel Neal altogether declined to authorize the adoption of measures which, if the tycoons, that is the shoguns government, were to be regarded as the government of the country would have amounted virtually to making war upon Japan. And the French minister expressed an opinion entirely coinciding with that of his colleague. Karma councils prevailed and diplomacy was left to its own resources. Arrangements, however, being made by the naval commanders in chief to patrol the settlement during the night and to station guard boats along the seafront to communicate with the ships in case of alarm. Although Willis felt at the time that Neil was an old woman, that's in quotation marks, uh, Sato considered in retrospect that Neil's refusal to yield to the temptation of instant revenge was entirely justified. He shrewdly observed that the foreigners were in Japan to trade, not to engage in senseless tit for tat hostilities. Moreover, Neil had no doubt seen many dead bodies at close quarters in his military career and was not willing to see many more. Uh, again, a long quotation from a diplomat in Japan. Looking back now after the lapse of nearly a quarter of a century, that is from Bangkok, see chapter four, I am strongly disposed to the belief that Colonel Neal took the best course. The plan of the mercantile community was bold, attractive, and almost romantic. It would probably have been successful for the moment, in spite of the well-known bravery of the Satsuma Samurai. But such an event as the capture of a leading Japanese nobleman by foreign sailors in the dominions of the tycoon, the shogun, would have been a patent demonstration of his inner incapacity to defend the nation against the outer barbarian, uh, in other words, the foreigner, and would have precipitated its downfall long before it actually took place, and before there was anything in the shape of a league among the clans ready to establish a new government. In all probability, the country would have become a prey to ruinous anarchy and collisions with foreign powers would have been frequent and serious. Probably the slaughter of the foreign community at Nagasaki would have been the immediate answer to the blow struck at Hodogaya. A joint expedition would have been sent out by England, France and Holland to fight many a bloody battle and perhaps dismember the realm of Mikados. In the meantime, the commerce for whose sake we had come to Japan would have been killed. And how many lives of Europeans and Japanese would have been sacrificed in return for that of Shimazu Saburo? 
Sato then comments on his reaction on first hearing the news of the incident. It is passages like the following which cause some people to regard him as a cold-hearted individual. The charge seems more than a little unfair. Sato himself justifies his detachment as that of a professional diplomat, and the fact that he expresses secret shame indicates that he was not so cold after all. Again, quotation marks. Uh, I was standing outside the hotel that afternoon and on seeing the bustle of men riding past inquired what was the cause. The reply, a couple of Englishmen have been cut down in Kanagawa did not shock me in the least. The accounts of such occurrences that had appeared in the English press and the recent attack on the legation of which I had heard on my way from Peking had prepared me to look on the murder of the foreigner as an ordinary everyday affair. And the horror of bleeding wounds was not sufficiently familiar to me to excite the feelings of indignation that seemed to animate everyone else. I was secretly ashamed of my want of sympathy. And yet, if it had been otherwise, such a sudden introduction to the danger of a horrid death might have rendered me quite unfit for the career I had adopted. This habit of looking upon assassination as part of the day's work enabled me later on to face with equanimity what most men whose sensations have not been deadened by a moral anesthetic would perhaps have considered serious dangers. And while everyone in my immediate surroundings was in a state of excitement, I quietly settled down to my studies. Sato's single-mindedness about his studies was such that he was able to blot out the horror of the Richardson affair from his consciousness. He was to witness many more horrors before the restoration in the same detached and cool frame of mind. The bombardment of Kagoshima. Having obtained an indemnity for the Richardson affair, the Namamugi incident, as we probably should call it, from the shogunate of 100,000 pounds in accordance with instructions from Lord John Russell in the Foreign Office, the British turned their attention to the exaction of reparation from the daimyo of Satsuma, Lord John Russell being the Foreign Secretary at the time. The British demands were the trial and execution in the presence of English officers of the murderers of Richardson and the, and the payment by the daimyo of an indemnity of 25,000 pounds as compensation to Richardson's relatives and to the three other members of the party who had been attacked. Colonel Neal requested Admiral Cooper to uh, convey him and his staff to Kagoshima to present the demands. That's Cooper, K-U-Umlaut, P-E-R. So uh, we might call it, we might say Cooper, in fact, but uh, I think it seems to be originally German, so it would be Cooper in the German. With the, with the German accent, the umlaut. Okay. A, lot of, a total of seven ships headed by the flagship HMS Euryalus left Yokohama on the 6th of August, 1863. Sato and Willis were in the paddle sloop Argus. The squadron arrived at the mouth of the Bay of Kagoshima five days later. On the morning of 12th of August, it anchored off the town. A letter was delivered stating the demands. It had been translated, Sato states disparagingly, somehow or other, into Japanese by Seabolt and his teacher. In the afternoon, 40 men came on board the flagship with concealed weapons. The British were wisely cautious and allowed only two or three in the Admiral's cabin. They thereby thwarted a scheme which amounted to a hijack attempt. Negotiations broke down, and at dawn on the 15th, some foreign built steamers were seized by the British and battle was joined. The Argus was involved in seizing the Sir George Grey, bought by the Satsuma clan from Britain, with two prisoners. At noon, the Japanese shore batteries opened fire. After the scuttling of the prize, young Sato described with jubilation his first experience of being under fire. He has a quotation again. I shall never forget the interest and excitement of the whole affair, from the bursting of the shells high in the air against the gray sky all round the flagship, as she lay at anchor before we weighed, until we came into action ourselves and could see a round black thing coming straight at us. Fortunately, the battle did not become too interesting. The Argus was struck only three times. Sato's bravery under fire was later commended by Colonel Neal in a dispatch to Lord Russell. However, Sato did not return the compliment. He noted that some disagreement had occurred between Admiral Cooper and Colonel Neal, 
who had wanted the Admiral to land men and seize some guns as trophies. This Sato regarded as excessive interference in military matters by the Colonel due to his impetuous nature. Sato also disapproved of the act of unnecessary severity in bombarding and destroying large parts of the town by the newly developed breech-loading Armstrong guns and by rockets, which Neil or Cooper apparently claimed was accidental. Sato concluded that this was untrue. He had seen with his own eyes the Perseus firing rockets into the town after the engagement with the batteries had finished. He had also read the dispatch penned by Neil, which noted with satisfaction that one million pounds worth of property had been destroyed. It is not certain whether Sato had read the article in the New York Times of 24th November 1863, headed British Barbarity, in which Cooper's actions were roundly denounced. The crime, which is to stand forever as almost first on the blacklist of fearful cruelties committed by the strong against the weak, is the recent burning and shelling of an unprepared Japanese city containing 180,000 inhabitants against whom there was no war by the British Admiral. The engagement at Kagoshima was by no means a clear cut victory for the British and Satsuma often claimed they had won by beating off the British attack. There had in fact been a number of British casualties including Captain Josling and Ca Commander Wilmot on the flagship. Cooper's dispatch printed in the Times of 31st of October listed 13 killed and 59 wounded. On the 17th of August, the squadron proceeded to return to Yokohama. Sato com commented that most of the crew of the Argus were bitterly discontented, and he thought the same was true on the other ships. In spite of this, in mid-November, two high officers of Satsuma appeared at the legation and acceded to the original demands, at least formally. The fine was paid with money borrowed from the shogunate. Sato concluded that to have enforced the original demands in full, it would have been necessary to invade Satsuma and cause the loss of many more innocent lives, an action for which he saw no justification. Sato and Willis. Dr. William Willis, 1837 to 1894, of the legation staff, was already in Japan when Sato arrived. Their friendship was to last until Willis died in 1894. Sato introduced him in glowing terms in Diplomat. He wrote that he had never met anyone more conscientious in his private or official life. He was the most tender and sympathetic doctor and surgeon, and he exposed himself to personal risks to look after those wounded in battle. Yet Sato felt that Willis was not merely a good doctor. He was also a most competent administrator, a hard and loyal worker. Now we have a quotation again from a diplomat in Japan. In the Chancery, his services were indispensable. He it was who swept the Aegean stable. Should that not be Aegean stable? I'm not sure. Uh, arranged the archives in order and brought the register up to date. Always on the spot when he was wanted, an indefatigable, indefatigable worker and unswervingly loyal to his chief. After nine years service, he was promoted to be a vice consul but by this time, the Japanese had become so impressed with his value as a surgeon and a physician that they begged him to accept a salary more than four times what he received from the Foreign Office. And he went where his great qualities were likely to be of more use than in trying petty police cases and drawing up trade reports of a city, Edo, uh, which, had, which never had any foreign commerce. Willis was a man of mountainous proportions. Sato, who is depicted in cartoons by Wergman, that's Charles Wergman, W-I-R-G-M-A-N, of Japan Punch, as a thin, weedy individual in comparison, was suitably impressed by Willis's size. Again, quoting from a diplomat in Japan. His gigantic stature made him conspicuous among all the Europeans who have resided in Japan since the ports were opened. And when I first knew him, he was hardly five and 20 years of age. A man endowed with an untiring power of application, accurate memory for words and things, and brimful of good stories from the three kingdoms. Uh, I think that means England, Scotland, and Ireland. Uh, big men are big hearted, and he was no exception. This last comment is, of course, a sentimental overgeneralization, but shows clearly Sato's affection for Willis. 
Willis, for his part, wrote of Sato on the 30th of September, 1865. The Sato family seem, very, seem clever. Our member of them translates and writes Japanese now with great ease, and in these acquirements has almost no competitor. He is young, and this is a great matter in learning a language, and he has the genius of industry to a marvelous degree. Sato and Alcock. Sir Rutherford Alcock, 1809 to 1897, returned from England on the 2nd of March, 1864, and Colonel Neal left the scene. In the period between the Kagoshima bombardment and Alcock's return, Sato had devoted himself to language study with his three teachers whenever he was not required by Neil to do the wrist-aching and mind-numbing copying of official documents known as chancery work. He had taken a small wooden house with Willis in a back street between the native and foreign settlements of Yokohama. So they were renting a small house there. It is clear that Sato's relationship with Alcock was an harmonious one. We have already noted how Sato avoided mentioning Alcock by name as a supporter of the theory that Chinese study was a necessary precursor to the study of Japanese. Alcock was also the diplomat who had caused much bad feeling in Yokohama by describing the foreign merchant community as the scum of Europe. But again, Sato did not name him in his memoirs, even though he mentioned the remark, attributing it only to an English diplomat. On the other hand, in chapter nine of Diplomat, Sato wrote that the new chief was popular with everyone. What is more, Alcock allowed him to escape from the stultifying miseries of clerical duties and devote all his time to Japanese studies. Alcock, for his part, was impressed by Sato's language ability, reporting that he was the only student interpreter who was able to read and translate Japanese. Alcock himself tried very hard to become proficient at Japanese and produced two books devoted to the Japanese language. The first was published in Shanghai in 1861, the second in London and Paris in 1863. I believe they were not very good, but anyway. Among the documents which Sato translated were some notes of a visit to Europe which a subordinate member of the recent Japanese embassy had kept and which with the normal humility of a junior official he had called a confused account of going to Europe like a fly on a horse's tail. A letter from home. Sato often left long periods between diary entries and they vary greatly in both length and significance, but we find an important entry not in diplomat reflecting his ambitious state of mind with regard to his choice of career on the 26th of March, 1864. It tells of a letter dated 10th of December, 1863, from his father, Hans David Sato, offering him 100 pounds per annum if he would go back to England and study the law. Sato wrote that he was put in a great state of perplexity, that's in inverted commas, by the letter. If he remained in Japan, his life would be free and adventurous and he could continue his Japanese studies. On the other hand, if he went home, he would probably become rich, get married, travel in Europe, enjoy good music and abandon the immorality of his bachelor life. On the 14th of March, uh, Sato had asked Alcock about his career prospects. Alcock only just returned from leave, had only just returned from leave and lent a sympathetic ear. Again, quoting from a diplomat in Japan, he replied very kindly, listened to my arguments very patiently and promised to write home for my promotion. I'm sorry, this is quoting from di his diary, not diplomat in Japan, beg your pardon. He replied very kindly, listened to my arguments very patiently and promised to write home for my promotion. But although I decided to stay, I am not quite sure whether this was the whole reason, for after all, it was small comfort. It is more probable that I felt that to leave Japan and return to that dull old England would be to destroy the real happiness of my life and to cut off all the ties I have formed during the last two and a half years. Not only ties of friendship, for they are weak compared with what I have at home, but attachment to the country, to the language and to the people. Having now decided which course to take, I must stick to it and try to win the position of a great Japanese scholar. For to know this language well is my intention, and to this end are all my efforts directed. Very few European books ever open themselves before me, and I am gradually losing every tincture of my original knowledge of ancient learning. The reward, I hope, will be a great one when it comes. 
Here, young Sato is clearly and movingly setting out his goal of becoming a great Japanese scholar. In the process, he feels he is forgetting his classical education, but this is a price he is prepared to pay for the deferred benefits of mastering Japanese. Was England really so dull? Perhaps so for a man forced back into the bosom of his strict non-conformist family, as Sato surely would have been. We may speculate at the nature of the immoral life which Sato says he has been living. Undoubtedly, he was fond of wine, women, and song at this point in his life at any rate. Yet there are only a few details in his diary. At the same time, Sato seems to have felt some guilt about the way in which he let his puritanical father down. Later in the same entry, he noted that he hoped to be able to show his gratitude some day or other to his father for his constant kindness. Uh, continuing uh, in the diary, if he knew me now, he would, I think, look upon me with different eyes, but to undeceive him and to let him know straight out that I am no longer the same moral or supposed moral youth I left him would be cruel to him and unpleasant to myself. Among the reasons for refusal of his father's generous offers, Sato felt that the jealousy of his brothers was a significant factor. Yet he also expressed a hope that he might one day pursue a commercial career in Japan. Uh, again, quoting from the diary, but I still have another arrow in my quiver. Trade for which my knowledge of the language ought in some measure to fit me is a thing which would fit in with all my desires. Here, Sato may have been thinking of repaying his father's kindness by following in his footsteps. Fortunately, he decided to continue to serve his country as a diplomat, although he never forgot that trade was the reason for the British presence in Japan. Shimonoseki preliminaries. In the summer of 1863, the Choshu clan, acting under orders from the emperor to expel the barbarians, had fired on an American merchant vessel, a Dutch corvette, and a French dispatch boat as they passed through the narrow straits of Shimonoseki between the islands of Honshu and Kyushu. Olcock arrived from England with a mandate to enforce the treaties and protect British trade. Sato thought that only the total defeat of the warlike Choshu clan would suffice to convince the Japanese nation that Britain was determined to enforce the treaties and to carry on her trade without interference from anybody, irrespective of internal disagreements. This was clearly a view influenced by that of the minister Olcock, though not shared by Lord Russell, the foreign secretary in London, who later called Alcock to account for his actions. Alcock quickly rallied a coalition of the representatives of France, Holland, and the United States, and issued an ultimatum to the shogunate that if they did not promise to reopen the Straits of Shimonoseki within 20 days, foreign warships would be sent to achieve this end. At about this time, two of five Choshu students who had gone to England secretly with the help of the Nagasaki-based Scottish merchant Thomas Glover 1838 to 1911, to study the ways and technology of the foreigners firsthand, Ito Shunsuke, uh, later Hirobumi, and Inoue Monta, later Inoue Kaoru, whom Sato referred to as Inoue Bunda, uh, arrived back in Japan to warn their clan of the futility of tangling with the mighty foreigners. Both of these samurai had participated in the attack on the British legation in July 1861, and had studied at University College London, Sato's alma mater. They were later to distinguish themselves in government and became Sato's intimate acquaintances in later years. Alcock obtained the consent of his colleagues to send two warships, Barossa and Cormorant, to Shimonoseki with the two Japanese on board, bearing a long memorandum for presentation to their daimyo. Sato met Ito and Inoue for the first time aboard the warships on the 21st of July, and jointly with them and his teacher, Nakazawa Kensaku, put Olcock's memorandum into Japanese. Ito and Inoue were then put ashore on the 27th of July, with Nakazawa pessimistic that they would be executed for fraternization with the enemy. In the event, they returned on the 6th of August with an answer from the daimyo of Choshu. There was nothing in writing, however, and the daimyo requested a postponement of three months so that he could ask the emperor to rescind the expulsion order. This answer was, of course, unsatisfactory. The powers under Alcock's lead prepared for military operations, although a dispatch dated 26th of July was on its way from Lord Russell in London, prohibiting such operations in the Japanese interior and limiting naval operations to defensive measures 
to protect the life and property of British subjects. However, at this time, there was no telegraph beyond Gaul in Ceylon, uh, Sri Lanka, as we know now, know it now. So the message did not arrive until the operations were over. Shimonoseki, naval operations and peace concluded. On Sunday, the 28th of August, 1864, a combined fleet of 17 ships set sail from Yokohama. Sato was delighted to be appointed interpreter to Admiral Cooper on the flagship Euryalus. He messed in the wardroom and slept on a sofa for lack of a cabin. The photographer Felix Beato was the only other civilian on the ship. Sato's teacher, Nakazawa, had been secretly taken away from him by the shogunate, but Willis lent his teacher, whom Sato thought was greatly inferior to Nakazawa. On the 5th of September, the bombardment began at 10 minutes past four in the afternoon. It lasted for one hour. The following day, Sato took part in the landing of a mainly British force of almost 2,000 men who were sent to make sure the Choshu batteries were silenced. In Diplomat, Sato has left a graphic description of his experiences. It was clearly a great adventure for the young civilian and a resounding victory was won for the loss of only eight killed and 30 wounded. As at Kagoshima the year before, Sato records some friction between the chief diplomat and Admiral Cooper. Alcock wanted to attack Hagi on the Japan Sea coast, which, which intelligence indicated was the stronghold of the daimyo. However, the admiral refused because he believed his mission was complete as soon as the Choshu forts were destroyed and the straits were opened. Peace was concluded with Choshu soon after on the conditions that the batteries should not be reconstructed, the straits should be kept open to foreign shipping, and a punitive indemnity should be paid, ostensibly for sparing the town of Shimonoseki from bombardment, but actually to cover the cost of the Allied expedition. On the 22nd of October, the shogunate signed a convention agreeing to pay $3 million in settlement of all claims, the money to be divided among the foreign powers. After Shimonoseki, Olcock honored his promise made to Sato on the 4th of March. He wrote home to recommend that he should be promoted to the position of interpreter, set free from all other duties, so officially no more chancery work, hooray, and have his salary doubled from 200 pounds to 400 pounds a year. Accordingly, from the 1st of April, 1865, B.M. Allen notes that Sato took the rank of interpreter for the Japanese language attached to the consulate of Yokohama. Gunboat diplomacy. Alcock himself was initially not so fortunate. In November, 1864, Lord John Russell recalled him to London to explain his warlike actions, much to the disgust of most Japan residents. Russell was no advocate of gunboat diplomacy, unlike the forceful and popular Lord Palmerston, who as foreign secretary had defended the bombardment of Athens, the so-called Don Pacifico affair, in a dusk to dawn speech on the 8th of July, 1850, and thus thwarted then Prime Minister Russell's intentions of, intention of removing him from office. However, in a dispatch dated 19th of November, 1864, in answer to Russell's dispatches, which he saw as censuring his conduct, Alcock wrote, what has been done was necessary to avert our expulsion from Yokohama and war as a certain sequence. My whole defense and justification is there so far as the motive, the object, and the means employed are concerned. The results speak for themselves. A catastrophe has been averted, the danger of war indefinitely deferred, if not altogether prevented, and our position at Yokohama secured from all immediate risk. Trade nearly extinguished has been restored with increased vigor. It seems that the final sentence weighed most heavily with Lord Russell, who accepted Alcock's justification and even congratulated him in a reply dated 31st of January, 1865. Russell also sought to conceal the initial reasons for Alcock's recall. You were ordered home that you might in person give to Her Majesty's government fuller information as to the state of things in Japan than mere dispatches could convey. That's quoting from Russell. The final ironic twist in the tale, uh, that's a play on words, tale, T-A-I-L and T-A-L-E, was that when the success of the Shimonoseki attack in protecting British trade was made clear, Alcock received promotion to become Her Majesty's Minister at Peking. 
That Alcock was lucky is shown by Sato's note in Diplomat of the experience of Vice Consul Gibson. When transferred to Formosa, that's the old Portuguese name for Taiwan, he got into difficulties with the Chinese officials and ordered the commander of a gunboat to bombard the custom house. He was sharply reprimanded by the foreign office and soon afterwards died a disappointed man. Baldwin and Bird. Alcock's departure from England was briefly delayed when on the 20th, 20th of November, 1864, two officers of the 20th Regiment Legation Guard, a Major Baldwin and Lieutenant Bird, were hacked to death in Kamakura after visiting the Daibutsu, uh, Daibutsu or Great Buddha. Sato attended the execution of two supposed accomplices on the 16th of December and, one of, and of one of the murderers, Shimazu Seiji, on the 28th of December. His language skills were in demand as both witnesses and Shimazu himself were interrogated. In his last moments, Shimazu chanted a verse which Sato translated, I do not regret being taken and put to death for to kill barbarians is the true spirit of a Japanese. Sato reports that the executioner had to hack the head off, a most horrible sight, and concludes in his memoirs that he was forced to despise the assassin, but at the same time he regretted that a man who is evidently of such heroic mold should have believed that Japan would be helped by this action. He then added a horticultural image, culled no doubt from the garden of his Devonshire retirement home. In the end, he felt nothing was wasted as the blood of the foreigners who fell under the swords of Japanese murderers and the lives which were sacrificed to avenge it bore fruit in later days and fertilized the ground from which sprang the tree of national regeneration. Alcock left for England in December 1864. For the period between ministers, Mr. C. W. Winchester, as Secretary of Legation, was chargé d'affaires. Sir Harry Parks, 1828 to 1885, was appointed Minister Plenipotentiary for Japan in March 1865 and arrived at Yokohama in July. From this time on until they both left Japan in 1883, Sato served under Parks. The relationship was never an easy one. Sato records in Diplomat that Parks was strict and severe in service matters, but in his private relations gracious to all those who had occasion to seek his help and a faithful friend to all who won his goodwill. Unfortunately, Sato was not one of these, and the result was that from the beginning to the end of their relationship, they were never friends. However, Sato made sure that Parks never had reason to complain of sloth or unreadiness to take his share of the work. Parks was born in 1828, making him Sato senior by 15 years. When Parks arrived in Japan in 1865, he was 38, a young age for a minister. Despite the lack of a university education, he had worked as Chinese interpreter under Alcock, who became consul in Amoy, in 1844. He then became consul in Amoy, Canton, and Shanghai. He had been a member of Lord Elgin's mission to Peking in 1860, during which he, that is Parks, had been arrested and imprisoned by the Chinese authorities for three weeks, chained for 11 days, and threatened with execution. In short, his reputation as a tough but seasoned diplomat preceded him. Sato wrote of him that his prestige was that of a hero in the eyes of all European residents in the Far East. Ratification of the treaties. It was for the thorough and formidable, but also often irascible and hectoring parks that Sato was obliged to work as interpreter in many difficult interviews with the Japanese. The first of these concerned ratification of the treaties of 1858 by the Emperor Kome, 1831 to 1867. Alcock and Winchester had both grasped the importance of ratification for British trade, especially as there was a possibility that the Shogun might be overthrown in a civil war. Sato credits Winchester with a suggestion in April 1865 to the Foreign Office that ratification by the Emperor and the reduction of import duties to a uniform 5% would be a fair exchange for remission of two thirds of the Shimonoseki indemnity. Russell instructed Parks to submit this proposal to the foreign representatives in Japan. In a conference on the 26th of October, their agreement was obtained and a squadron of nine ships, five British, three French and one Dutch, left Yokohama on the 1st of November. Sato and Seabolt traveled with Parks on Admiral King's flagship. The ships arrived off Hyogo, Kobe, on the 4th of November, where they stayed for three weeks of intense negotiations. 
the details of which have been exhaustively covered by Grace Fox in Britain and Japan, 1858 to 1883, published by Oxford University Press. Uh, quite a long time ago now, I think eight, hmm, 1960s or 70s. In between composing and presenting letters for negotiation, Sato joined the Admiral and Sir Harry in exploring the neighborhood with a view to selecting a site for the foreign settlement. The locals were friendly, contrary to the expectation given by the shogunate. Uh, Sato concluded that the shogun's officers were afraid that fraternization between foreigners and the townspeople would undermine their authority. As negotiations dragged on, Park sent Sato with Hegt, H-E-G-T, a young Dutchman, to Osaka to inspect a house that had been assigned for the accommodation of the foreign representatives. There they met with bumbling officials and a large hostile crowd, in contrast to the ones in Kobe. Hegt was on the point of losing his temper when Sato wisely made him return his revolver to its pouch. Sato observed that they were in no danger and could not afford to commit a murder for a trivial reason. On another occasion, there was a curious rencontre meeting with a Satsuma steamer captain who lamented that he could not provide an onnagochiso, literally feast of women, and showed his cabin fitted up for the entertainment. Sato commented that this gentleman was too civil by half, but still, the contrast to the aloofness of the shogun's officials was very agreeable. Finally, in the afternoon of 24th of November, the foreign envoys were informed of the emperor's consent to the treaties. The tariff was to be revised to 5% and the indemn indemnity would be paid promptly. Another demand for the early opening of the port of Hyogo was rejected. So the date was still set at the 1st of January, 1868. However, Sato noted that the opening of Hyogo two years early was a concession which few people had expected and the merchants at Yokohama were not yet ready to open a branch in other Japanese cities. The success of the negotiations caused general rejoicing among the foreign representatives and their governments. Yet Sato notes in Diplomat that the payment of the indemnity was never in fact completed and survived the revolution to be a constant source of irritation and ill feeling between the Meiji government and the British minister. E. H. House, H-O-U-S-E, noted in his article on Shimonoseki that the indemnity was finally paid in full in July 1874. Furthermore, Sato, ever the keen-eyed linguist, claims that the existing treaties were in, not in fact explicitly sanctioned due to the absence of the definite article in the Japanese language. The difference between treaties are sanctioned and the treaties are sanctioned is a material one in English. However, the negotiations had allowed Sato to prove his worth to Parks. British policy, a catalyst for the Meiji restoration? Question. And here's a quotation. Uh, but there are many circumstances which prevent the bulk of our readers from the study of these subjects, and it is for the many that we write, not for the few. Quoting the Japan Times, 19th of May, 1866. Parks was bound and instructed by London to observe strict neutrality with regard to the internal affairs of Japan. It did not greatly concern him which of the rival groups won the power struggle for the control of Japanese affairs. Stability was much more important. Parks was more concerned to see law and order established in the country, that is, an environment in which foreign trade, uh, specifically British trade, could pros prosper. On the other hand, Sato and Mitford, who arrived in October 1866, were certainly not neutral, any more than Thomas Glover, who sold arms and ships to rebel clans and arranged a visit by Parks to Kagoshima in 1866. Not only did they cultivate the Tozama daimyo, the outer lords of Satsuma, Choshu, and other domains, who, unlike the hereditary Fudai daimyo, had only submitted to Tokugawa Ieyasu after the defeat at the Battle of Sekigahara, but Sato went to the mischievous extent of publishing three anonymous articles in the Japan Times, edited by Charles Rickaby of March and May 1866, which originally had no title. Two of these articles have been reprinted in Grace Fox's Britain and Japan, 1858 to 1883, but the second in the series has not yet been located. It is hard to believe that Parks was unaware of these articles, and as Kotatsi states, as Sir Hugh Kotatsi, the late Sir Hugh, Sato's disobedience of the clear instructions from London regarding neutrality may have been a factor in the coolness between the two men. 
Um, I must uh, confirm uh, the date of the uh, Grace, um, sorry, Grace Fox's Britain and Japan. Uh, it's uh, Oxford Clarendon, Clarendon Press, 1969. Okay. So I was just checking in the bibliography. Let's continue. <clears throat> The essence of the views expressed by Sato in the articles was that the Shogun had fraudulently signed the 1858 treaty with the foreigners. He was merely one of many great feudal daimyo and all the daimyo should be united together under the supremacy of the emperor uh, as confederated daimyos. Treaties should then be made with the emperor to be binding on the whole of Japan. In Diplomat chapter three, Sato stated that the Jesuits in the 16th and 17th centuries had believed that the emperor was a spiritual dignity, dignitary and uh, spoken of the shogun as the real ruler. Kempfer, uh, 18, 1651 to 1716, called the two potentates ecclesiastical and secular emperors, but Sato clearly felt that this position was not set in concrete. In the first article written by Sato dated 16th of March, Sato began by noting that a vessel belonging to the daimyo of Satsuma had attempted to trade at Yokohama in the previous week and had been prevented from doing so by the Japanese government. The foreign representatives had requested protection of the government from the daimyo's retainers, so the Japanese government could not be blamed for this. Moreover, Sato felt that no other option had been available to the foreign representatives. The problem lay at a deeper structural level. Sato strongly attacked the shogun as guilty of fraudulent misrepresentation of his status. Well, he actually referred to him as tycoon in the article. The shogun claimed to uh, conduct the government of Japan and had signed the first treaties in such a capacity, but in reality, he was only the head of a confederation of daimyo and his pretense of being the ruler of the country of which he only controlled about half was an incredible piece of presumption. Sato argued that the shogun had overstepped his authority and called for radical change. It was a waste of time to have a treaty with just one daimyo, however powerful. Uh, in other words, the foreign powers must supplement or replace their present treaties by treaties with all the daimyo of Japan. In the third article dated 19th of May, Sato pointed out that tycoon was a title to which only the emperor had a right and that shogun or shogun, that's uh, S-H-O-G-O-O-N or S-J-O-G-O-O-N or Sigun, S-I-E-G-U-N, was the proper title of the head of the bakufu, literally tent government or shogunate. Sato claimed that this was a deliberate and fraudulent deception and that on this technicality alone, the treaties were vitiated. The final paragraph is strident. In the series of articles published in these columns on, this, on the question, we have, we maintain fully and conclusively proved that the Shogun has deceived the representatives of the Western powers and fraudulently concluded treaties, many of whose provisions he is unable to carry out. That other clauses which he can observe if he will, he persistently violates, that the continuance of the existing arrangements are likely to lead to a political crisis in Japan and the great disturbance of our trade, and that this trade can never, under present regulations, acquire the importance and value which is its due. Sato, earnest by name and earnest by nature, that's E-A-R-N-E-S-T, uh, called for a new treaty, not merely the rat ratification of the present one, which had in any case already been achieved. Uh, again, quoting, uh, we leave the question now in the hands of those who have the power of bringing it to a solution in the earnest hope that at no distant date we may see the present treaty abrogated in favor of a more comprehensive and satisfactory one, a fair and equitable convention with the Mikado and the Confederate daimyos, the real rulers of Japan. The phrase Confederate daimyos seems to be Sato's invention. It is also interesting to note that the Mikado is mentioned only briefly in the first article, but assumed central importance in the third article. The articles were first translated into Japanese by Sato himself, with the help of his teacher, Numata Tor Torasaburo, specifically for the head of the Awa clan, now Tokushima. 
Eventually, several copies were made, and at least one of these was printed and sold as a pamphlet called A Kokusakuron, British Policy on the Streets of Kyoto and Osaka, without Sato's foreknowledge, but with his name appended, even though the original articles had been written anon anonymously for the Japan Times. It was wrongly assumed by many important Japanese to represent official English policy and was influential because of this. It also spread Sato's name throughout Japan. In passing, we may wonder if the articles influenced the Scottish merchant Thomas Glover at all in his sales of arms, particularly to Choshu. Sato surely met Glover in Nagasaki at some point, though he's mentioned only once in Diplomat on the unrelated subject of paper money. Sidney Devere Brown, in his first edition of the Nagasaki Journal Crossroads, summer 1993, allows the interpretation that Glover may have acted as an agent of British imperialism, which secretly and unofficially backed the emperor's cause to counter French support for the shogunate. I think the operative words there are secretly and unofficially, certainly the official British position was neutrality. A telegram from father. Sato admitted in his memoirs that it was very irregular, very wrong, and totally against the rules of the consular service for him to have written the articles on English policy in the Japan Times. And by the way, the second uh, article in English has never been found. Um, only Japanese translations of it. And I translated one of those translations back into English. Uh, and published it in the Kyushu Institute of Technology uh, Bulletin. Um, okay, Department Bulletin. Parks must have known that Sato was the author and was no doubt officially displeased, but privately not so, question mark. He did not openly express his displeasure, but when in August 1866, Sato and Seabolt wrote letters to him asking for an additional 100 pounds a year in view of their increased workload, Parks was angered. So this would be increasing salary from 400 to 500 pounds, wouldn't it? Um, Sato, sure that his application would be refused, wrote to his father that the service was not worth remaining in. Just as two years earlier, his father had sent a letter. This time Sato received a telegram telling him to come home. Sato then went to Parks and asked for his resignation to be accepted. After a little humming and hawing, Parks finally produced from a drawer a dispatch from Lord Clarendon, then Foreign Secretary, which had been lying there for several days, granting the applications of both Sato and Seabolt. Sato consequently abandoned his, attention, his intention of leaving the service. So Parks had been sitting on this uh, promotion, uh, or sorry, this uh, rise, in, rise in pay. This was not the last time that Sato and Parks clashed over pay and promotion. Relations never seemed to have improved significantly, but Parks was clearly shrewd enough to realize the value of young Sato to the litigation. Sato notes that at this time he was able, with the assistance of a native writer, and sometimes without, to put an official note directly into Japanese. Also, he was able to read and translate into English all sorts of confidential political papers, which the Dutch interpreters could make nothing of. Moreover, at interviews with the Japanese ministers, Sato and Seabolt were able to interpret directly between English and Japanese with a speed and accuracy which the two-man teams of Japanese, Dutch, English interpreters could not match. Yet Seabolt was not as skilled at reading or writing as Sato. As Sato. Sato and Mitford. Algernon Bertram Mitford, 1837 to 1916, from 1902 Baron Reedsdale, that's R-E-D-E-S-D-A-L-E, arrived in Japan by way of a stormy passage from Shanghai in October, 1866. He stayed there for only about three years, living, leaving on the 1st of January, 1870, and returning for a brief visit in 1873. During his time in Japan, he worked closely with Sato in the gathering of information and intelligence useful to Parks, cultivating close relations with many of the Tozama Lords. Sato and Mitford were chalk and cheese. Mitford was, first of all, a classic gentlemanly product of Eton and Oxford, where he attained an undistinguished second class. His baronial language lineage could be traced back through the Mitfords in Northumberland to the Norman conquest. 
He was born in 1837, making him six years older than Sato. He came well recommended to Parks as a skillful and hard worker and a talented linguist. He had already served in St. Petersburg, though he had no Japanese knowledge and Sato was by 1866 well advanced with his language studies. Midford's blue blood and educational background combined with family connections, his father had served for a time in the diplomatic service, to get him into the foreign office by the accepted route of nomination. Sato's lesser background would never have allowed him to enter the foreign office by the same route. Instead, he entered the consular service very much on his own initiative and by the back door of the interpreter's examination. In this sense, Alcock and Parks were like Sato. All three were specifically recruited for the Far East and had no real prospect from the beginning of a posting outside the triangle formed by Siam, China, and Japan. Linguistic and local knowledge was regarded as crucial for postings in the Far East, and the Foreign Office did not regard the skills needed there as interchangeable with those required in other parts of the world. Mitford, on the other hand, after his time in Japan was again in 1871, offered a post in St. Petersburg, which in the Eurocentric world of the Foreign Office was a top diplomatic posting. In the 19th century, there were no British embassies outside Europe. In his memoirs, Mitford described the first arrival in Japan in very different terms to those of Sato. The weather was dismal and the people seemed lifeless and dirty. This is quoting now from Mitford. My first landing in Japan was a gloomy disappointment. Could this be the fairyland of whose beauties we had heard from, the earlier, from earlier travelers? The sky was gray, sad and unfriendly. Gusts of wind turned umbrellas inside out and defied waterproofs. Where was Mount Fuji, the peerless, the mountain of the gods? Veiled, curtained and invisible like the charms of an odalisk, that's a female slave in a Turkish harem, at the sweet, sweet waters of Europe. The low eaves of what seemed to be a custom house were mere runlets of water, drip, drip, drip. In front of the building, a number of yakunin, small government employees, bristling with sword and dirk, clad in sad colored robes with quaint lacquer hats, a mob of coolies with raincoats made of straw, looking like animated haycocks, sodden in an unpropitious season, a woman or two clattering and splashing in high uh, wooden patterns, carrying babies sorely afflicted with skin diseases slung behind their backs, a melancholy arrival in all truth and sufficiently depressing. Yet after a few days, Mitford began to see more beauty in his new surroundings. At last Mount Fuji appeared and he became more excited. Walking out that afternoon and suddenly coming in full view of Mount Fuji, snow-capped, rearing its matchless cone heavenward in one gracefully curving slope from the sea level, I too was caught by the fever of intoxication which the day before had seemed quite inexplicable, a fever which burns to this day and will continue to burn in my veins to the end of my life. In his memoirs, Mitford has left us with his impressions of both Parks and Sato. Of Parks, he wrote, Sir Harry Parks was certainly a very remarkable person. He was a small, wiry, fair-headed man with a great head and broad brow, almost out of proportion to his body. His energy was stupendous. He was absolutely fearless and tireless, very excitable and quick to anger. Having been sent out to China as a boy of 13 in 1841, he learned the language with almost superhuman industry and was doing important work as interpreter, often in most dangerous expeditions, at an age when other boys are yet wondering whether they will ever get into the school 11, that's soccer or cricket. His career in China is too well known for me to refer to it here. When he was only 38 years old, he was appointed minister to Japan, and there later in the year I joined him. He often expressed to me his regret that his education had been so early broken off. The loss weighed heavily upon him, yet no man would have suspected him of want of literary culture. He must have created time, for busy as his life was, he had read greedily, and he often took me by surprise in unexpected ways. His great shortcoming as a diplomat was want of a knowledge of French. French was, of course, the lingua franca of diplomatic postings in Europe. Mitford spoke it well, but Parks had little opportunity to acquire it in the Far East. Little or no opportunity, I would say. Mitford seems to have had great respect for Sato's linguistic abilities and no doubt envied Sato his Japanese skills, which he regarded as indispensable to the legation. 
Parks had at his elbow a man of extraordinary ability in the person of Mr. Sato. He it was who swept away all the cobwebs of the old Dutch diplomacy, and by an accurate study of Japanese history and of Japanese customs and traditions, realized and gave true value to the position of the shogun, showing that the Mikado alone was the sovereign of Japan. Nor was this all. His really intimate knowledge of the language, combined with great tact and transparent honesty, had enabled him to establish friendly relations with most of the leading men in the country. Thus, young as he was, achieving a position which was of incalculable advantage to his chief. About a week after Mitford's arrival in Yokohama, during which he was at first lodged in the legation and experienced a minor earthquake, he was installed in new living quarters. It was, again quoting, the daintiest little cottage in the world. It was built of fair white wood and paper, not much bigger than a doll's house and quite as flimsy. It had a tiny veranda decked out with the half, half a dozen dwarf trees looking onto a miniature garden about the size of an Arab's prayer carpet <laughs> and was one of a group of three such dwellings, the other two being occupied by Mr. Sato and Dr. Willis. So we formed a small legation colony on the outskirts of the native town. It was all on so miniature a scale that it seemed as if one must have shrunken and shriveled up in order to fit oneself into it fit oneself to it, sorry. As for Willis, who dear man was a giant, how he got into his house and how once in he ever got out again remained as big a mystery as that of the apple in the dumpling. How did the apple get in there? I suppose. <laughs> um, after a housewarming shared by Sato, Millis, Willis and Mitford with a few officers of the 9th Regiment and three or four geisha, the tranquility of the little colony was short-lived. On 26th of November, 1866, a fire at Yokohama destroyed a quarter of the foreign settlement and a third of the Japanese town with astonishing speed. Most of the foreign residents were still at breakfast when the clanking of fire bells rent the air. Very soon panic broke out as fugitives desperately crowded onto a ramshackle bridge over the river. The cottages of Sato, Mitford and Willis were burnt down. Sato managed to get nearly all his books, clothing and furniture, including his harmonium, a massive article, as he says, out of his cottage. As a scholar, his first thought was for his English-Japanese dictionary in manuscript form, which he was preparing with Ishibashi, one of the Japanese native interpreters. If that went, I lost the result of two years labor. Results of two years labor. He transferred everything to a godan, that's a warehouse, which was promptly consumed by the flames. He managed to save the manuscript and a copy of Alcock's colloquial Japanese, but lost everything else, including his dog. His diary records, most sad of all, was the loss of my dear dog Punch, a Sky Terrier from Nagasaki. Yet it is typical of the young Sato with his thirst for adventure and his monastic lack of concern for material possessions that he should comment in diplomat, at the close of the day, there remained to me only the clothes I had on my back, and I was hatless. But the excitement had been so lively that I felt rather pleased at the idea of beginning the world afresh. Transfer to Edo. Sato had been moved to the legation office in Edo in the, in the autumn of 1866. He went to Edo on December 10th from Yokohama. The staff at this time consisted of A.B. Mitford, second secretary, Willis, assistant accountant and medical officer, Zebolt and Sato, interpreters, and Vidal, a student interpreter. Sato was kept busy with revising the Japanese wording of the 1858 treaty, which wrongly placed the shogun on the same level as Queen Victoria. With the aid of his teacher, he produced an accurate translation, which was adopted as official. Uh, again, a quotation from a diplomat in Japan. It was the keynote of a new policy which recognized the Mikado as the sovereign of Japan and the tycoon, that is the shogun, as his lieutenant. We gave up the use of tycoon, which my reading had taught me was properly a synonym for the Mikado in our communications with the Japanese government, though retaining it in correspondence with the foreign office in order not to create con confusion. But the most important result was to set in a clearer light than before the political theory that the Mikado was the treaty making power. As long as his consent had not been obtained to the existing treaties, we had no locus standi, that's a recognized status in law. Uh, we, well, after he had been 
induced to ratify them, the opposition of the daimyos ceased to have any logical basis. Christmas in Nagasaki. Shortly after Sato's arrival in Edo, Park sent him to the western part of Japan to gather information. He arrived in Nagasaki on the Princess Royal on 23rd of December, 1866. On the evening of Christmas day, Sato records in his diary that he dined at the house of uh, Vice Consul Annesley and had a gorgeous dinner, more remarkable for quantity than quality. Sato must have taken a turn at the piano for he wrote, Mrs. A squalled and shrieked at my songs, though she has not the slightest idea of music, but it was great fun. Two days later, Sato visited Alexander Siebold's half-sister and informed her of the death that same year of her father, Philipp Franz von Siebold. Sato must have heard the sad news from Alexander. He described her as a fine-looking woman aged about 40. She was a surgeon and midwife and exhibited her midwifery in instruments to the amusement of Sato. She told Sato that her father had been unlucky enough to get another child on the body of a female domestic when he was last in Japan. This phrase is not a pleasant one, but it is Sato's own. Sato learned in Nagasaki that half of Shikoku was in favor of the opening of Hyogo, now Kobe, to foreign trade, but people in Kyushu opposed it on account of the anticipated decline of Nagasaki. He was also told by an officer of Higo, now Kumamoto Prefecture, that there never would be another shogun, but that the emperor would be restored to the throne. Kagoshima and Uwajima. Sato reached Kagoshima in southern Kyushu in the Argus on the 2nd of January, 1867. He went ashore to stay at the factory with the three resident Englishmen. The next day he spoke with three high officials of Satsuma. They discussed the confrontation between Choshu and the shogunate. Sato learned that the Satsuma clan was against the opening of Hyogo and that Choshu and Satsuma would unite to oppose the shogun. The Satsuma officials confirmed the dislike of the French led by their flamboyant Minister Monsieur Léon Roche, 1809 to 1901, a former Spahi cavalry officer, Spahi, S-P-A-H-I. The French were supporting the shogun. On the other hand, they reaffirmed their, they reaffirmed, this is the Satsuma officials reaffirmed their friendship with the British, as Sato remarks, because they had learned to appreciate the value of our enmity, a reference to the bombardment of Kagoshima. On the 5th of January, the Argus left Kagoshima and anchored in Uajima Bay in the west of Shikoku Island at 11 o'clock on the following day. Here he was able to indulge in a favorite pastime, curio hunting, but also gathered some new intelligence from the retired head of the daimyo's family, who declared his hope that Japan would become a confederated, confederated empire with the emperor at his head. At its head, I suppose. Um, it turned out that he had read and been influenced by Sato's articles published as a Kokusaku on British policy. I think I've noticed a mistake for the first time at its head, not at his head. Um, Sato and Saigo. On the 11th of January, the ship reached Hyogo. Sato walked about the town and found the people quite accustomed to the sight of a foreigner. Here he met Saigo Takamori, 1827 to 1877, the great Satsuma leader. Saigo turned out to be the same man who had been introduced to Sato in November, 1865 as Shimazu Sachu. Saigo laughed heartily when Sato reminded him of his alias. Uh, Shimazu was of course the Daimyo's family. The discussion turned to unsuccessful attempts by the Bakufu, Tokugawa shogunate, 1603 to 1867, to suppress Choshu, and Sato attempted to reassure Saigo of the neutrality of the British government with regard to the internal affairs of Japan. Saigo must have read A Koku Sakuron, British policy, so Sato felt obliged to restate the official position, perhaps covering his tracks in the process. This is again quoting uh, from a uh, diplomat in Japan. We have a treaty with Japan, not with any particular person, and we don't intend to interfere with you in the settlement of your domestic disputes. Whether Japan is government, governed by the Mikado or the Bakufu or becomes a confederation of separate states is a matter of indifference to us, but we want to know who is the real head. 
I confess to you that we have serious doubts about the Bakufu. We saw that they are not supreme or rather not omnipotent when they asked us to let them off the opening of Hyogo. Then the murder of Richardson and the impotence of the Bakufu to punish his murderers showed us that their authority did not extend as far as Satsuma. Then when ships of war belonging to friendly nations were fired on by Choshu, we had to go and punish him because the Bakufu could not do it. And we see now that Choshu has got the best of the late war. These things make us doubt the supremacy of the Bakufu throughout the country. And we had hoped that the council would settle the difficulty. So this is Bakufu being the shogunate. Saigo indicated a plan of opening Hyogo for the benefit of the whole of Japan, in contrast to the opening of Yokohama, which had benefited the shogunate only. Sato and Saigo parted on good terms after dinner. The next morning, Sato left for Yokohama. Monryu In. Sato reported to Parks on his return to Yokohama on the 15th of January, 1867. The next day, he took up his quarters in Edo. At this point, he rented a little temple with Mitford as the legation buildings were miserably uncomfortable. Uh, Mitford relates the move in his memoirs. What with the discomfort of the buildings, the sensation of being closely guarded, and the inquisitive watchfulness of the Bette Gumi, the legation guard, we felt as if we were in prison. And so Sato and myself uh, begged Sir Harry to allow us to hire a little temple outside. Our chief jumped at the idea, for he was naturally anxious to do everything that would tend to break the spell of lack of freedom, which he rightly felt to be most detrimental to any real intercourse with Japan. So Mr. Sato and I rented Monryu Inn, a delicious little shrine, I think he means a Buddhist temple, a few hundred yards from the legation on a tiny hill commanding a lovely view over the Bay of Edo. We were the first foreigners to live out of bounds in that great city. In their delightful menage a deux, uh, uh, Sato and Mitford saved on the expense of a cook by having dinners delivered from Manse, a Japanese cookshop. Mitford continues, from that time forth, it will be seen that Sato and I hunted very much in couples. I was nominally the senior and had to draw up the reports of our proceedings, but I may say once for all that it his was the brain which was responsible for the work which I recorded. It is difficult to exaggerate the services which he rendered in very critical times, and it is right that this should not be forgotten. First visit to Osaka. The first news that Sato learned on his return from Western Japan was that the new shogun, Tokugawa Keiki, after the death of Tokugawa Iemochi on the 19th of September, 1866, had announced his intention of receiving the foreign ministers at Osaka. Parks hesitated briefly, but then sent Midford and Sato in the first week of February 1867 in a man of war, a warship, to make the necessary arrangements and settle all the questions of etiquette and procedure which might arise. On landing at Hyogo, they heard the news of the death of Emperor Kome and the succession of the 15 year old Mutsuhito, later known as Emperor Meiji. Both Sato and Midford commented in their memoirs that this was a most fortunate chance, as Kome was strongly opposed to all associations with foreigners and Sato stated that his disappearance from the political scene was most opportune. The visit was an ideal opportunity for information gathering and meeting clan leaders. On arrival in Osaka with a huge escort, Sato estimated 1,500 men, Midford between two and 3,000. They were visited by officials of Uajima, Satsuma, Choshu, and Aizen. For the first time since the bombardment of Shimonoseki, Sato met Inoue of Choshu, that's Inoue Kaoru. He had a huge scar on his face received in the course of fighting in Choshu. He declared that his people had now got the steam up and would like to give the shogun another thrashing. Sato and Midford had some time for shopping. In his, let, in his diary for 14th February, Sato noted that he spent the morning with Lacaman, photographing and receiving purchases made yesterday. He was shocked at the frightful prices asked for everything, but purchased some books for the legation library. They also found a most wonderful pipe shop and bought several different kinds of thin-stemmed Japanese pipe. Uh, that pipe is known as a kiseru. On the 16th of February, Sato and Mitford went to Satsuma's Kurayashiki, rendered by Sato as produce agency, 
Sato noted in his diary that they retired into an inner room to talk over matters to the following result. The Mikado died on the 25th of the 12th month, 30th of January, though it is given out that his decease only took place on the 3rd of February. He is succeeded by his son, a youth of 15, who might become a clever man if properly educated and made acquainted with foreign relations and the general knowledge of worldly matters. But the Bakufu unfortunately prevents any teachers who, who could be of use from approaching him. The emperor was effectively a prisoner in Kyoto, surrounded by servants, spies, and women, as he had been for centuries past. On the 19th of February, when they were preparing to leave, Sato and Mitford were visited by Aizu men from the north of Japan. Aizu's people came again to Tiffin this time and were regaled with champagne and tin case meats, very much to the elevation of their spirits. Yamada in particular was quite overset, which was proved by his shouting across the table to me to know what the English was for danshoku, uh, sodomy, and whether we had it in our country. And the next man produced a lot of skibi, presumably a mishearing by Sato of skibe, vulgar word meaning indecent, pictures which he generous, generously distributed amongst us. On the 21st of February, Sato and Mitford left Hyogo by ship, returning to Yokohama on the 24th, where they received the shocking news of the suicide of Vidal, a student interpreter. In March 1867, Sato had some time off to visit Atami and Hakone in the company of some friends from Yokohama. Atami on the Izu Peninsula overlooks Sagami Bay and is surrounded by mountains on three sides. It developed as a resort town in the eighth century. Sato noted in his diary for the 26th of March, 1867, rose pretty early and prepared for the journey by walking about the town. All the hotels have their woodwork stained red, a color not much seen anywhere else. The barrier consists of two roofed in gates, enclosing a courtyard through which the road passes with guard houses on each side. The notice board says amongst other things, dead bodies, wounded persons and suspicious individuals will not be allowed to pass without passports, from which it is to be inferred that a dead body is regarded with considerable distrust. Sato's inference was indeed correct. It was a frequent ruse of the desperate to try to get past the barrier by posing as a corpse. Well, this is proving quite long, this chapter two, so I think I'm going to stop it here and uh, continue with another video. Uh, continue chapter two in the next video. Thank you.